fracture that keeps the fracture open after the fluid all leaks off. And that something is your propant. It, uh, people used to use all kinds of things before, including walnut shells. If you go back to the 40s and uh, late 40s and early 50s, they used to say walnut shells. Now, then we talked about sand, actual natural sand. Then you use artificial uh, propant. Uh, and these days you use all kinds of things. And as we're going to discuss later, it depends on the formation, how deep it is, how what stresses and so on and so forth. We'll get into that. The important thing for us to know now is you're using propant to keep these fractures open. And we're going to see why we want to keep it open when we get into the fluid flow part of it later uh, this morning. So let us talk a little bit. Let us talk a little bit about the, the birth of the process. The idea of hydraulic fracturing uh, came up several years ago, almost uh, 70 plus uh, years ago. And it was conceived by a gentleman called the Floyd Ferris. It was a small oil company that uh, later on became Amoco. I, you, you probably don't even recognize the name because Amoco was taken over by, by uh, BP uh, many years ago. Uh, maybe not, uh, when I talk about many, many years ago, I believe it was in sometimes in the 90s. So it is still, it is still 20 plus years ago. Uh, uh, the first job was successful. Uh, at least mechanically, they fractured the well, they created the fracture that they wanted. However, there was no production whatsoever. One of the problems they had is in order to carry sand or propant, you, you need to, and in order for the fluid not to leak off into the formation, you want to make it a little thicker, a little higher viscosity. So you gel the fluid. But you, at the end of the job, you need to break that gel again. Otherwise, it will damage the formation. So these days, at the time, let me go back. At the time, the first job, they did not have a gel breaker included in the fluid. And so what happened, you have no gel breaker, so there's no production. It's damaged well. So obviously, uh, the jobs after that, they added a gel breaker, well, very much like what we do right now, where it uh, starts acting, it has delayed reaction. So delayed reaction, very much like when you, uh, one takes a Tylenol and it, uh, it releases slowly with time. This is a very similar thing. Now you have the breaker is released slowly with time, it breaks the, the gel at the end of the job, and you can clean it up, there will be no problem. So the, the second and third job worked very well. And the company, Stanoloid Oil and Gas Company, got a patent back in 1948. That's probably one of the most valuable patent any company had got. So 1948 was a very good year. Um, there was uh, some experiments. Uh, let's talk about some of the experiments that happened before. Uh, the early on, early on, they were not using, uh, some of the cases were not using water. They, uh, they, um, they used napalm. Napalm is a, a very nasty fluid. Basically, it is uh, gel de kerosene and the gasoline. So you can see it, uh, it can catch a fire. Uh, it actually, napalm was used uh, before and after that time in wars. Uh, so if you can Google napalm, you're going to find out uh, where it was used. It's, uh, it's actually caused a fire in one of the early jobs and the inventor of hydraulic fracturing died in that fire. So it is 
after that, uh, people obviously started shying away from using uh, uh, fluids like that. We'll talk about fluids in, in a minute. Okay. The revenue from the patent that was issued was actually is the, uh, contributed very much to construction of Amoco Production Research Lab in uh, the Tulsa, Oklahoma which has been given to one of the universities now since Amaco moved out or was taken over by BP. So let us talk about how it progressed. So you started the first job. It was in uh, Hugoton. Um, the first job was in Hugoton Field in uh, Kansas, United States. Uh, by late 1948, uh, we there was 23 wells that were fractured. Uh, so it was very successful. No other patent was applied as fast and has as high impact as uh, the patent on hydraulic fracturing. At the time, they called it Hydrafrac. And in 1949, a company, a service company called the Hauko got exclusive license for that Hydrafrac process. Hauko is actually Halliburton company. It is, uh, as you can see, it is uh, it's Halliburton Oil Well Cementing Company. Uh, it, uh, Halliburton, Halliburton Company started as a cementing uh, company and uh, then uh, it got the license for hydraulic fracturing. So it became mostly a hydraulic fracturing company. I'm not talking about it, by the way, just for your information. I worked for almost uh, 32 years for Halliburton Company before going to universities uh, about 10 years ago, actually almost exactly 10 years ago. Uh, the commercial application increased very quickly. You have 322 wells that were fractured in one year. Success rate was, uh, was very high. Uh, even uh, offshore, uh, offshore application were uh, applied. Uh, the first company that did the offshore uh, fracturing was Kermagi. It doesn't exist anymore. It was taken over by Anadarko, and Anadarko was also taken over by another company. So, as you can see, there is a lot of consolidation in the industry. It was offshore, although it's only 18 feet of water, but uh, it is still it was 12 miles offshore. And now we, we drill and we fracture wells that are thousands of feet. Uh, underwater. By 53, you had 20,000 jobs. Uh, other companies were licensed to perform a hydrofrac. Uh, you can see Slumberger, Liberty, uh, Baker Hughes, and all those companies came in. And, and by mid 50s, with uh, the high rate water fracks and large jobs. Uh, the inter one interesting uh, evolution is initially people thought that uh, hydraulic fractures are horizontal, basically uh, along the bedding planes. Uh, till uh, there is a paper by Hubert, uh, Hubert and Willis uh, back in '56 that talked about the fracture should be vertical, unless you are at a very shallow situation. When most of our applications are deeper than 1,500 feet or so, they are vertical fractures. We are going to actually look at the equation from Hubert and Willis' paper. is a is a extremely important uh, paper that that uh, affected the development of hydraulic fracturing. Another paper that was very influential too was one by Anderson and Stahl. 1967, he basically looked at, uh, at hydraulic fracturing in the field and at the time there was the start of running experimental experiments in the lab, in, uh, in rock mechanics labs, and the, it did confirm that fractures are indeed usually vertical. Does not mean you are not going to see horizontal uh, fractures. They are fairly rare and under certain condition. We'll get into it uh, very little later on. But majority of your, uh, if your fractures will be, will be vertical. We'll talk about when we get in stresses next, uh, next week, we'll talk more about uh, this issue. Let me show you a couple of pictures. Uh, 
Uh, so you see what is, uh, how it used to be done. You see, this is very early frack. And uh, you can see they were just dumping sand by hand. And I can tell you from personal experience that this is usually a very bad idea. And they, now we don't do that. Now everything is mixed properly in a blender. I had to run an, an experiment, a field experiment actually. Um, not exactly, it was not exactly the, a field, but without going into detail, it was experiment that we're using uh, uh, actual uh, fracturing truck. Uh, so we're injecting at fairly high rate about one barrel per minute. So for a short time, we were, we were looking at a specific effect without, I don't want to go into that specific research. But when we try to do it by hand, things did not really work well because you can't keep constant sand concentration. Uh, so, so this is probably one reason they were, they were having some cases that were successful and some that uh, were not. By the way, the experiment that I ran, I've never written a paper on it. There was reasons for that. But they were very successful, I can tell you. Historical base fluid trends, you can see that although it started with oil-based fluid, quickly people moved into water-based fluid, so it became the dominant application. And also back in in late 70s and the 80s, people started getting into using foam. A foam is very, very good carrier of provant. However, foam does not give you, since it's mostly air, it does not give you a large hydrostatic head. And so it works very well in shallower formations, and formation that does not have very high pressure. If you have High pressure formation, you have deep formation, uh, foam may not be exactly the best option. Uh, people shy away from uh, oil based fluid uh, because of potential danger, you know. Uh, although uh, there was uh, some recent, fairly recent work where uh, um, propane was used, but Many major service companies shied away from it. Actually, the patent for that fluid was the, was done, I, if I remember correctly, by a Halliburton company, and they sold the patent because they did not want to be involved in potential risk. In the 60s, uh, now people knew that fractures are mostly Vertical, this, uh, we have more viscous gel fluid, and became a very high provant concentration in uh, late 70s. When I say high provant concentration, uh, I remember some of the cases we were involved in were um, uh, all in excess of six pounds per gallon. And some of them were going to 12, 14, and 16 pounds per gallon. That's very high. That's, you, you don't do that anymore. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you do it only if you have a very high probability formation. And we're going to talk a little about fracturing high probability formation. Uh, so things will start work well, and uh, people will start looking at, stimulation by using rate uh, uh, analysis of, of fluid. Okay, so this is basic, basic summary of, of how the fluid, uh, fraction fluid went on. If I'm talking too fast, please, uh, you know, let me know but you can listen to it again. Uh, then there was a, the increase in oil price really did change things. So let us look at, at prices. And this price is, if you look at it and looks a little different, is because we took all the prices to 2015 base. And so if you, if you look at the prices in 60 and 70, 
uh, they were um, they were two three dollars per barrel. But when you take it to 2015, it is it was close to uh, 2015 dollars. It would be close to twenty dollars, and you can see back in '73 there was a sharp jump in uh, in price of oil. If uh, I'm sure you are, most of you are too young to remember uh, or to even know, unless you read history books, and that's when uh, there was a war between uh, Israel and uh, its neighboring countries, the Arab countries, and there was an oil embargo. And oil prices went up, and it was very difficult to go back to that original price. And this, that's actually when it goes up to sixty dollars per sixty. The oil goes up to sixty dollars per barrel, or fifty, close to sixty. That means that you want to, you can spend the more money to bring in that oil, and that actually affected fracturing. So it started in the late seventies. In mid mid to late seventies, there was a lot of effort done into fracturing. A lot of technology been developed. I was uh, lucky. I actually got my PhD in seventy eight, and you can see in seventy eight, seventy nine, prices were going up. Companies were hiring. Activities were just uh, unbelievable. In um, in nineteen eighty eighty one, the price of oil was equivalent to $100 with today's uh, dollars. Uh, but uh, in mid-80s, there was a sharp decline in price. 86 was a, was a crash in, in oil business, uh, different from what we see right now, but still there was a crash in, in prices. And that, of course, affected uh, affected level of activities. The prices stayed a kind of low for some time, and it picked up again in years in about 2000s. I will get into that in in a in a bit. I, you are going to see that um, graph again. Right now, I just want to focus on on that on that early part. So in mid 80s, we had the very first crash. And the rate count went down from over 4,500 down to, I'm talking about in the United States. I, internationally, they had 1,700, went down to 800. So it was not as bad. Uh, fracturing, however, was more concentrated in, uh, in United States. Although we were involved in fracturing, even at the time, there was some in South America, I was involved very much in, in that, some in Brazil, some in Canada, but was focused mostly in the Western Hemisphere. There was not a whole lot in the Eastern Hemisphere. And at the time, there was companies starting to do downsizing, and they called it right-sizing. There was salary freeze, there was furlough, I remember, um, working uh, several weeks, six weeks, and then take a week off without pay. That was a common thing to save jobs for everybody. And then we got, when we, in the late 80s, although some people think it is fairly recent, in the late 80s, uh, we, we got into fracturing horizontal wells. Actually, the first project was a research project I was personally, I was involved in that project. I was in, we, we looked at a well, actually a small oil company came up with the idea. They contacted Halliburton company. We formed, Halliburton formed the team. We were looking, some people were looking at logs and some people were looking at cementing. Um, I was involved in it from the rock mechanics, fluid flow and the fracturing side. Actually, I wrote a paper on the subject. We presented it in 1988. It was, was published um, in uh, oil and gas, not in oil, in um, um, JPT, Journal of Petroleum Technology, back in 1990. So that's 30 years ago. Uh, and if you read it, you're going to see 
some of the stuff that we still talk about is uh, so amazing uh, the things just to go in except we were looking at fracturing wells horizontal wells but we're looking at creating of four to six fractures per well uh, first the horizontal wells were not very long and the number of fractures because we had to create every fracture independently and so uh, we we did not create a huge uh, number of fractures. We, we fractured the wells here in, in the late 80s, we fractured wells in Canada, of course in the United States the first, we fractured wells in the United States, in Canada, South America, and we had a very interesting project in Europe, in Germany, where we fractured the one well. I actually, I was involved in that. I ended uh, uh, traveling I found about it the day before the meeting. I had to fly to Germany. We had our meeting. We talked about how to design it, what to do, and uh, we flew back. It was, it was an interesting uh, trip. Uh, and then we, we got into, eventually, we, we fractured the, um, we, 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 we fractured chalk. That was was very interesting. We got into fracturing Austin chalk. It was very successful. Uh, however, it was hit and miss sometimes because if you don't intersect the natural fractures and the chalk, it is not very successful. Then uh, a, a small company in the Burnett Shield wanted to try fracturing. Mitchell Energy, I should say. Mitchell Energy wanted to try fracturing horizontal wells in shale. And the boom, it worked very, very well. So wells that were not, were not very productive all of a sudden, they were extremely productive. And so that has started uh, the, 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 the increase in, uh, in shale or the shale revolution, as people call it. Uh, the Burnett shale works very well for reasons we can uh, discuss later on. And uh, uh, so we, as we, as we started working with other shales, we wanted to do something where to make those shales similar to the Burnett shale. Well, we can discuss that uh, in, uh, in later on, and uh, although it is more of a, a research area, but but it's very interesting to talk about. And so, and so, uh, the reason you you look at uh, the two thousands now, prices are going higher, and increases, and uh, now you end the fracturing shale, and uh, as you fracture shale, you're producing more oil and more gas. And that affects the price of uh, of oil and gas, so it ends going down. So you, you, the industry is really successful in doing things, but in a in a way, it, it hurt. It hurts a little because it reduces price. So the uh, you can see recently the prices were going up to hundred dollars per barrel of oil and then boom suddenly it declines because you there's a lot of shale in, in the world and uh, not only the western hemisphere was fracturing but also the eastern hemisphere so we most people think of uh, of fracturing as only for low probability reservoirs that is that is in, in a way true, but it's also not exactly true. Uh, we, we fractured low probability reservoirs, we get into fraction shale, we'll talk about that in the next, two, next few weeks as we work. But it, we have also fractured the high probability formation. Uh, we, we are not going to get much in that, but if you're, if you're interested, there are a bunch of papers. We wrote a paper on, on the subject back in 93, 94. We wrote a couple of papers on that subject. It's a very important uh, subject, by the way, because we, we have been fracturing uh, 
who are formation in the Gulf of Mexico. And they are formations that have not one or two millidarsi. And we talk about low permeability reservoirs like in shale that is nano darcy, micro, uh, micro darcy and nano darcy. But uh, in, uh, in the Gulf, we fractured the formation that is can be 10, 20, 50 millidarsi formation, but under a special condition that we are not going to be discussing right now. But those formations have been fractured and we've been analyzing the data. We'll get, when we get into the analysis, I will show you an example of, of fracturing uh, hyper formation. And so, uh, and basically, when, when you do that, it originally was, was looked at as sand production control, but it's actually a fracturing process. Uh, fracturing implementation is very complex. I, I, uh, it, you, you, need, you need knowledge, uh, not only fluid flow. Many, many of uh, petroleum engineers, they end up getting trained only in in, in fluid flow, but th this is more than just a fluid flow. It is fluid flow, it is fracture mechanics, it is rock mechanics, uh, uh, it's uh, some operation, you need to look at prop and so there is a lot of things one has to, has to learn in order to be an expert in, uh, in that area. And it is uh, fairly expensive There is uh, for a company to apply. This is the one reason you have uh, specialized service companies that, that do the, the fracturing. Uh, what, um, oh, let's talk about this a little bit because it's also related to something that I've given lecture on to, to students some time ago and you are going to see it also on YouTube. The hydraulic fraction different between the hydraulic fraction and the other fractioning techniques because one can say, hey, I can fracture using something a little different. I can use explosive or propellant. I'll talk about both of that. And actually, in I did not talk about, I did not mention in history of hydraulic of fracturing. About uh, so at one time uh, people used uh, or. It was an experiment to use nuclear bomb. And this actually was applied. And as you can see, it's a really a bad idea. But uh, people have tried explosives and explosives is, is a bomb basically. Yeah. And the pressure goes up very fast. So in a microsecond you reach uh, many thousands, maybe a million psi. And so it, it is very damaging to the, to the formation. Besides, it also reaches high temperature. Uh, propellant, which is, uh, uh, is not exactly explosives, it's uh, um, basically solid uh, rocket fuel. It burns, it burns very quickly. It reaches very high pressure, but it's uncontrolled. In, in millisecond, you can reach uh, very high pressure. So, in creating multiple fractures, uh, explosives will do this even more of that. It uh, creates cracks all over. And then we have the plasma stimulation. That's what I discussed in waterless fracturing some time ago. You'll find it in YouTube. You may maybe you want to look at it sometime if you're interested. We also reach very in a few microseconds, we reach high pressure, but not as high as what you see in propellant or explosives. And you end up having multiple frags, but it is more controlled the process than you see in propellant, as, as well as repeatable. In hydraulic fracturing, now you reach that maximum pressure, which is fairly low relative to, the, to those other three approaches, but it takes uh, many seconds or even minutes. So it is, uh, although everybody will talk about it as, as a dynamic process, but when you look at what uh, properties we use in hydraulic fracturing, we use the aesthetic properties of, the static mechanical properties of the rock because it is fairly relatively slow. You're not vibrating the grains, you are 
cracking the, the rock uh, relatively slow, uh, relatively slow compared to explosive propellant or plasma. Those take microseconds, uh, hydraulic fracturing takes uh, many seconds or even minutes. So this is basically a representation of what happens. You can see explosives create cracks in, in every direction. And they may not be as effective when we get into the fluid flow. Actually, longer hydraulic fracturing is definitely more effective than having an explosive that crushes the rock and it, um, it can make the rock somehow glassy. Um, you know, multiple propellant, uh, the rise time is fairly fast and it can create multiple frags. There's other applications along that people have used uh, propellant as well as having high pressure nitrogen to follow up, to follow the, that uh, fracturing of, uh, of, of the well. And so there was a lot of applications on uh, in this approach back in uh, in the mid 80s and the early 90s. Um, it's not used as much as we, we look at. Uh, then hydraulic fracturing has been always very, very successful. Uh, when, when we look at the fluid flow, we'll, get a com we'll show you a comparison between hydraulic fractures, uh, how it changes production. And you can quickly will see an, uh, a relative comparison with, uh, with other uh, applications. So let me look at, um, at the f fluid flow. So hydraulic fracturing is a tensile failure. Just to, to remind you, if you have not studied that, uh, if you, if you look at a rock, any rock, like sand stone, is very strong in compression. If you get a rock and you test it under compression, it takes very high pressure even without surrounding the rock with stress. So if you have unconfined compressive strength of the rock, unconfined meaning that the, the sample you are, you are putting under compression does not have any uh, stresses on it sideways. Uh, the rock, the unconfined compressive strength of, of sandy stone is in the neighborhood of 4,500 to 5,000 psi. So it's fairly strong. And uh, now if you apply confining stress, it increases very quickly. We are not going to talk much more about it than that, or at least right now, but in tension, rocks are very weak. Uh, the tensile st strength of sandstone, for example, would be between 100 to 200 psi. You, so you can see that comparison between 5,000 psi and uh, a couple of hundred psi. So, uh, so fractures uh, in, in rocks will, is, a, is a tensile failure not a compressive failure, although sometimes people think it is, you're compressing the rock, it's, it's com compressive failure, but actually you need to look at the tip of the fracture, it is breaking under tension. This is one reason many times, sometimes in the equations, people may ignore that uh, the tensile strength of, of the rock. Okay. How does it work? You know, if I ask you uh, why fracture works and you tell me that because you change probability of the formation, you would flunk this course. The fractures, does, it, it may change the probability just around the fracture phase. But fractures work not because they change probability, but because they modify the flow pattern inside the reservoir. So if I'm looking at a droplet of oil, and instead of this droplet moving to the well board, taking a long path, I, I don't know whether you see my... So if I have droplet of oil here, rather than, than moving to... Sorry. Uh, 
rather than moving to the well bore, it moves the ferrous to the hydraulic fracture. And then this hydraulic fracture has very high probability. The formation may be micro Darcy or, or a fraction of milli Darcy, but uh, the probability inside that fraction may be in Darcy's. Actually, depending on the type of fraction, it may be going from 10 Darcy to 100 Darcy. So it, the pattern of fluid flow changes is no longer, no longer radial flow. You know, you study these equations, Darcy equation, most people will study Darcy equation and talk about uh, radial flow. Here is not radial flow, it's a lot more complex than, than radial flow. We'll, we'll talk about the different type of radial of flow inside reservoir in, in a second. So when I look at the uh, hydraulic fractured well, I would say, well, one, one wing of, of the fracture is uh, length is LF. And the most, the most time people will, uh, will assume that the hydraulic fracture uh, has symmetry. So both lengths are the same. Are they exactly the same? Probably not, but it's, unless the difference is huge, which usually is not the case, you, you can't tell the difference. You can, you can approximate it with symmetric fractures. So you're saying I have length of LF, I have fraction width of W, and W and this fracture width may, uh, after the fracture closes, it, it may be 0.2 inch. 0.2 inch is about five millimeters. I, I, I tended to use uh, English units, that's what we use in, uh, in the field. So it's about 0.2 inch, and when a fracture high probability formation, we do special things, and we end up having maybe a wider frac, maybe going to half an inch or even up to three quarter of an inch. So that's a very wide frac. So what would be the probability of a smooth surface open crack if it's the width only is 0.01 inch? not even 0.2 inch. And the probability with, if it is open and uh, the surface is smooth, so I have two, uh, basically like a wedge here, a probability would be 54 times 10 to the power of nine W squared. So, uh, so you, you can see probability would be extremely, extremely high. Uh, however, realistically speaking, because the fracture is not as smooth, it has propant inside, there may be some damage around the fracture, you can, realistic fracture probability is, can be go from anywhere from one to 200 Darcy. You, you get this equation just uh, for, if you wanna find out what, how do you, how did I get this equation? This equation you get by, equating Pauzel's equation for uh, for open crack to Darcy equation. And so in, in most of our work, when we talk about from now on, I'm going to assume a simple frack. We'll, we'll work with simple frack where one wing is LF. So when I say fraction length, actually, I, uh, I'm talking about, I'm talking about one wing of the fracture. So when people talk about LF, they talk about one wing of the, of the fracture. And I'm going to say my original formation probability is K, formation probability is, uh, fracture probability is KF, and width of the fracture is W, or WF. Okay. And I'm going to assume I'm, I'm uh, penetrating the whole formation. So I uh, have height edge, the P zone is have the same height. Obviously you can deviate from those uh, conditions, but that's not for this class here. We're looking at basic behavior. If you've studied petroleum engineering, you, you know some of those parameters. Uh, so uh, let me say, uh, let me look at the changes in those dimensionless parameters. <clears throat> 
So I'm, I'm assuming you already know what dimensionless pressure is for case of, of oil, liquid, case of gas. So in case of liquid, here it is. In case of gas, uh, here it is. And if this one, this would be dimensionless rate, one over dimensionless rate. In case of when I deal with hydraulic fracture, now dimensionless time, uh, when I have radial flow, we have these terms, everything the same, except I have RW square. In case of fracture, we replace the RW with length of one wing of the fracture, so LF square. Now there is one parameter you need to remember always which is dimensionless fracture conductivity. That's an important parameter. It's actually, it's, it, uh, it relates the fracture effectiveness, basically, to formation. So you have KFW. This is your fracture width, uh, fracture width time fracture permeability divided by formation permeability and one level length of, uh, of the fracture, one wing of the fracture. So CFD is a very important parameter to remember. In some old literature, they are going to call it F sub CD. Uh, some people still use that F sub CD. It is the same thing. So F CD or CFD, uh, SPE likes to use CFD right now. KFW divided by KLF. You have to remember that. Some of the dimensions parameters you know, if, if you are my student taking my class, I would expect you to know those definitions by heart. You know, you can't always Google things. So let us talk about what kind of hydraulic fracture we, we have. I'm going to talk about only two types. One is infinitely conductive fracture, so infinite conductivity fractures versus finite conductivity fractures. Uh, first, is there anything as infinite conductivity fractures? The answer to this is no. There is nothing like infinite conductivity. However, it behaves, the system will behave as if it has such a high conductivity that for all practical purposes, it is infinite. Let us say this in a different way. Basically, an infinite conductivity fracture what we are saying is that the pressure drop inside the fracture is so small relative to the pressure drop inside the reservoir that I can ignore it, ignore the, the pressure drop inside the fracture. So if, if my pressure drop inside the fracture is 1 psi and the pressure drop inside the formation is 500 psi or 1,000 psi, and then you're talking about way smaller than 1%. So I can assume that as if there is no pressure drop inside the fracture. So many, many high conductivity fractures that behavior. Finite conductivity fracture, basically all I'm saying is the conductivity, the pressure drop inside the fracture is significant relative to the pressure drop inside the formation. It's not higher, it's still a lot smaller than the pressure drop inside the formation, but it, the value cannot be ignored. Okay, let's look at CFD. If, if CFD is higher than 300, then you can assume that the fraction is infinite. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to our webinar. Thank you. That is a lot you more know, stuff. Read all the literature. Actually, I five hundred. Uh, some in the recent literature, they may even look down to one hundred, and say this infinite conductivity fracture. However, many many of those fractures will behave as a finite conductivity fracture. So, so anything less than three hundred, at least from theoretical point of view, uh, will behave like finite conductivity fractures. So let's look at. Uh, uh, this graph was published, uh, this is the behavior of infinitely conductive fracture was published by Rainey and uh, some of his students, uh, there's more than one student who worked with him on that. 
uh, Remy was, uh, Professor Remy was professor in Stanford University. And uh, I had the privilege actually of taking uh, classes with him. Was a was a great professor in all aspects, as a researcher, as a person, great, great man. Uh, he passed away uh, many years ago. And so th that work is showing dimensionless pressure versus dimensionless time based on for a fracture. So it has LF square. And it shows something very interesting. It shows that the early time is a straight line with slope of one half, then you have curvature, and uh, that curvature continue like this. Uh, and then it, uh, it eventually, at about time of five, it behaves very much like radial flow. So the early time is slope of one half, then there is curvature that we can't really easily analyze. And then about dimensionless time of five, or if, you, if you're not very strict, you can say three, it, uh, the fracture behaves like radial flow, as if there is no fracture. And then if it sees a boundary later on, then the boundary effect will appear slow of one to one. Okay. So let us look at uh, this behavior. So the early time, uh, uh, slope of one half, basically if you take the logarithm of this equation, it gives you, it says that log of pressure, dimensionless pressure, or delta P versus log of time, it gives you slope of uh, one half. And this equation basically is equation uh, indicating linear flow. Anytime you see a square root of time behavior like this, usually this is linear flow. So early on, you have linear flow. Later on, after the dimensionless time of five or three, if you're not too strict, um, you, you have behavior of dimensionless pressure is function of natural log of time. Does this equation remind you of anything? This, the first part at least, is the, what you see in radial flow. If you look at radial flow equation without any fracture, it is PD equal to one half of natural log of TD plus the skin factor. So, so very early on is linear flow. After long time, is, it behaves like radial flow. So that assumption here is you can reach that radial flow. The measureless time of five, since it has LF square in it, can take long, long time. In, in classes that I teach, I get the students to calculate the time, say, for a tight gas formation to reach that dimensionless of time of five or even three. And they find out that it may be many, many, many years. You know, it's not uncommon to calculate 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the properties of the formation and on fracture length. And so you, and so that is, you don't always get to that, the radial flow, unless you have high probability formation and short fracture and liquid. In tight gas formation, forget it. You can't reach that radial flow. If you reach that radial flow, and you see I'm saying if you reach that radial flow, then that equation relating fracture length to skin factor would apply. So if you have tight gas formation, forget about this equation you cannot use. If you have high probability formation and this liquid, and short fracture, then yes, you could calculate the equivalent uh, scan factor. I think we are going to go a little beyond one hour here. Maybe we'll go to about um, another 20 minutes or so. Uh, for finite conductivity fracture, it gets more complicated. 
because early on you are going to see linear flow inside the fracture, uh, which uh, takes place uh, in, in only the first uh, few seconds, maybe to up to a minute or so, usually. So, although theoretically is interesting, uh, practically is not of great importance, unless, unless you run extremely precise tests. Uh, then you, you get to bilinear flow, and that is very interesting uh, uh, behavior. Because now you have linear, you have linear flow inside the formation, so fluid coming from close around the fracture, not very far. And so it's coming from the area around the, the fracture, moving linearly into the fracture phase, and inside the fracture is moving linearly to the well bore. And we are going to look at this a little bit more. Then you get to uh, linear flow inside the formation. Once the pressure drop inside inside the formation is a lot higher than, than inside the fracture, then it behaves as if there is no pressure drop inside the fracture and you're seeing linear flow inside the formation. Then you end up seeing that elliptical fluid flow. That's very difficult to analyze. You can only match data. You cannot, there is no specific graph to it. Uh, it is not like uh, square root of time or semi-log graph that you use in radial flow. Eventually you got, you get to the pseudo-radial flow. If you reach that, that pseudo-radial flow, which is not common at all to reach it in fractured cases, unless you produce for a very long time and you have a short fracture, you have fluid, you have liquid, and then you, you see that uh, behavior too. Um, so the, this is the early linear uh, flow. It is, as I said, it happens only sh for short time. I'm not going to go through the equations and details, but this is the only behavior where you do not see the, the fracture permeability, the KF and the fracture width together. In all other behavior, you are going to see KFW together as a product. And if you see KFW together as a product, that tells you you can't analyze those pressure behavior to separate KF from W. And this is one reason in analysis, people talk about KFW or you talk about CFD, you don't talk about fraction probability. You are, however, in the design part, you always talk about KF and W as the two separate components. Uh, bilinear flow would, will, not, will not show if the conductivity is very low and if the conductivity is very high. If it's very high, you don't have bilinear flow. It goes from linear flow directly to, to electrical flow if, uh, if the if the conductivity of the fracture is really, really low, and then you don't see that bilinear flow, you actually, it be, the system will behave as if it is radial flow. So if, you, if your conductivity of the fracture is too low, and then basically you don't have an effective fracture. Uh, th there is a lot more stuff that one can discuss in this that we, we it's beyond the, the scope of, uh, of this uh, lecture. And then I, uh, for finite conductivity fracture, you can see there's something interesting that appears here is in early time, you can see that the slope is about quarter when I put log of dimensional pressure or log of delta P versus log of uh, time. I see quarter slope, I see straight line that all parallel and a half quarter slope. That makes the analysis of data like this very difficult. Um, when <clears throat> there is implication to it, we'll, we're not going to discuss today. Today is just an introduction. However, it, uh, it is something interesting because I look at the equation, dimensionless, uh, dimensionless pressures, versus the measure this time, 
and I look at the equation that looks like this, where the measureless pressure is a fraction of the measureless time raised to the power of 0.25. And the equation has CFD, square root of uh, CFD. If I you go in, this is one of my favorite uh, question to students. I will let you think about it and maybe uh, Dr. Edgar, he will give it to you as a, as a problem. If I uh, substitute the, the parameters of the dimensionless pressure, the dimensionless time, and the dimensionless uh, uh, CFD, the dimensionless fractional conductivity, and I start the canceling parameters, I find out that fractional length cancels out. And the question would be, isn't it strange that the dimensionless pressure in a fractured system is independent of fractional length during the bilinear flow. So that, that sounds kind of strange, actually it sounds very strange. And the question would be, what, what is the implication of that? This is, this is fairly important. It actually leads to very interesting conclusion. I will let you reach that conclusion yourself like what I do to my a student when I teach. Uh, here, if I if I look at the at the linear flow inside the, inside the formation, you, you can see if CFD is very small, I don't have linear flow inside the formation at all. That's what basically uh, basically I'm getting to radial flow behavior to begin with. So CFD of 0.1 is too small. If I get to very high CFD, then I see that linear flow for some time. And as, as the conductivity gets, fraction conductivity gets smaller, the linear flow will start later in time and ends later in time. So it gets smaller and smaller. So you have a profile, something like this, like what we saw uh, in here, in uh, between between the, the quarter slope and and uh, this area, okay. And, yeah. and again, for finite conductivity fracture, with uh, we we get an equation similar to what we see in infinitely conductive fracture. Except now there is another term instead of 1.1, the term here is fraction of dimensionless conductivity. Uh, equivalent skin factor uh, can be cal calculated under specific conditions. As I mentioned, only happens when you, when, when, uh, when the fraction length is very short, you have liquid. Uh, uh, so that does not happen very often. We saw the equation in infinitely conductive fracture. For finite conductivity fracture, you can have this term N in it. And there's a couple of approaches that the approach using N is the one I have been using. Um, Sincule and others have another approach we will talk about it maybe later on uh, but the behavior n is is very straightforward approach i i'll show it to you basically what it says that this term n uh, the equation would be one over uh, you have an n here and you can see N is, if you have very high conductivity, N is two. It actually should be one over N. And if you're, as the conductivity gets smaller and smaller, you see going down this way, N gets larger and larger. So here LF, sometimes you write it LF over N. So LF over N is, if you have infinite conductivity fraction, like what we saw in the previous equation, L is equal to two. As, as conductivity gets smaller and smaller, N gets larger and larger, meaning that 
basically the effective fraction length is smaller. So as if your, your finite conductivity fraction, as if it can be represented by a shorter infinite conductivity fraction. This happens only, you have to remember that, that's, that this is not a just general equation, this happens only after you reach the radial flow or the pseudo radial flow behavior. Many people take it wrong and they think that you can always represent fraction length with a fraction well with radial flow system. That is incorrect. Uh, this is one reason when I predict production, I don't want to use equivalent skin factor, I want to use fraction dimensions. Uh, planning for fraction treatment, you can look at steady state or pseudo steady state, people have done that uh, before, or you can use transient behavior. Uh, for, uh, for steady state, there was a very interesting uh, a correlation um, that uh, it was originally published by, by Tensley and the other several people. Unfortunately, it had, um, had some problems. Uh, there was, I, I hate to say it, but there was some mistakes in, 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 in the equation. I, I ended taking it and I redid the correlation and I published this back in, I think 1980 or 81, I can't remember. <laughs> a long time ago, 40 years ago. But it is very interesting because let me let me go to the equation where showing one is uh, is clearer. It it tells you basically you when you design a fracture, you wanna go you don't want to be on that sharp curve. Because that sharp slope basically if you lose conductivity you sliding, well, let me go back and say, here this is basically productivity and indices relationship. The difference between hydraulic fractured, fractured well and unfractured well. So you want to be as high as possible. In here, mostly it is fraction of CFD. So you don't want to design a fracture where you're sitting here. Because if you lose conductivity and you're bound to lose conductivity with time, you, you the conductivity, the productivity of the well declines very fast. You want to be on the flat line, but you don't want to go so far in the flat line because once you get to a certain point here, you can increase conductivity very much, but you don't increase productivity that much. So that graph was actually very interesting. And that is the reason, you, you know, you always hear about dimensionless fractional conductivity of 30. Actually, we published that many, many years ago, and that is this curve is the reason for that dimensionless conductivity of, of 30. At the time, we published it based on another term that will be 10, but it had pi in it, so it was 31 and so on. So that gives you the historical reason because when you get to CFD of, of 30, you're actually on the flat line, a little deep in the flat line. If you go to 50, it does not increase productivity very much. It increases a little bit, but not very much. So you, but you want to avoid being on that uh, sharp curve. Uh, reading suggested reading material would be, would be SPE monograph number 23, uh, chapter 11. Uh, that's something that I wrote if several, about 20 years ago. And it is very interesting looking at analysis and it talks also about fractioning. Uh, there is uh, more um, stuff is uh, written in chapter 15 in book Well Construction. Unfortunately, the book Well Construction is out of print. It's very expensive to get. So I, I do not 
know how, what to tell you about it. SP monograph number 23, uh, that can be ordered from SP. It is a very good book. It's about well testing. So if you are in well testing, I would recommend this book. And the chapter 11 talks about well testing of hydraulic fractured well, but I have added a lot of stuff on hydraulic fracture design, some of the stuff we're talking about here. So these two chapters I wrote uh, some time ago. That is, uh, that is, takes care of uh, my presentation. Thank you for attending. And we'll take just a couple of questions. Other questions, we, if you have so many, we can always answer them in email. Uh, you, if you want to access my email, I am with university. It is very easy to uh, to get my email address. It is uh, uh, my Solomon. So, like what you see here, my without dots, of course, my Solomon at uh, That edu. That email does. That's an alias, but also you can find it as M Solomon at Central that you etch that edu. So I have uh, two of them. I will, you can reach either one. As I said, I'll, the presentation, PDF file of the presentation will be posted on ResearchGate uh, in the next couple of days. So you can download it and look at it uh, at your leisure. Thank you, Dr. Solomon, for this enlightening session. Now we'll move on to answering some questions by our honorable audience. Uh, someone says, what kind of potential um, dangers oil-based mud um, uh, or, sorry, oil-based fracturing fluid can cause to the formation? We are going to, to, when we talk about fracture design, we'll be addressing uh, issues like this, but uh, simply said, uh, you know, we, I worked for a service company for some time. We always brought, if it's a new reservoir, the new reservoir that we're fracturing, you bring a sample of, of the rock and you test it in different ways, mechanical testing to get Young's modulus for sun's ratio and so on and so forth. Like what we are going to discuss when we get into in situ stresses. Uh, so we can design the fracture properly from propagation point of view. You also test it against the 